place. I grew up in a real estate family. Uh, my father was a builder. My mother was a real estate broker. Uh, I'm, I'm a second generation builder developer, third, uh, fourth generation realtor. And I, I just saw how my parents were able to retire at 50 with cash flow. And to me, that seemed like the way to get out of the game. I could build buildings for other people, but at the end of the time that the building took to build, I was done with the job. There was no more money to be had, but I was watching my parents 10, 15, 20 years later, still getting paid from something they did 20 years ago. And I knew that was the ticket out of having to work for other people. Good evening. I want to talk to you today about raising capital to fund any deal. Now, I'm not going to tackle this topic alone today. I have a very special guest by the name of Mr. Shannon Robnett. Now, Shannon is a real estate developer and a syndicator with a principal focus on multifamily and industrial real estate in the greater Boise area. Now, some of his accomplishments include he is a second generation builder and developer. He's a fourth generation realtor. He's also been involved in over $250 million worth of construction projects ranging from multifamily, office buildings, and even down to storage buildings. Now, he has a history of over $140 million in successful developments. Now, without further ado, let's get into the show. have a fantastic guest on the show today. We have Mr. Shannon Robnett. How you doing today, sir? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. You know what? It's another fabulous day and I get more and more grateful for the time I have on this planet. Yes, sir. Me too. The same way. Now, I heard that you live out in Boise and Boise is a really piping hot real estate market. So I did an episode maybe about two to maybe three weeks ago, and Boise is actually the top place to invest in real estate in 2023. So would you mind explaining how you got started investing in real estate, sir? Yeah. You know, it was, uh, I, I really didn't have a choice. I grew up in a real estate family. Uh, my father was a builder. My mother was a real estate broker. Uh, I'm, I'm a second generation builder developer, third uh, fourth generation realtor. And I, I just saw how my parents were able to retire at 50 with cash flow. And to me, that seemed like the way to get out of the game. I could build buildings for other people, but at the end of the time that it, the building took to build, I was done with the job. There was no more money to be had, but I was watching my parents 10, 15, 20 years later, still getting paid from something they did 20 years ago. And I knew that was the ticket out of having to work for other people. I love that. And see, uh, myself, I'm also a, a generational person also. So I am a barber as well. And I'm the 10th generation barber in my family. So go. yes, there yes, I love yeah. it, Shannon. <laughs> so now the next question is, would you mind explaining about how raising capital to fund any deal? Would you mind kind of explaining that? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I started out in 2001 and I built my own building. I built a, a industrial building and I did it on my own and man that was miserable I had all my money tied up in one deal and I couldn't get you know I couldn't breathe and and the building got done and I was supposed to be getting cash flow on it and, and it was barely making me anything and I did that repeatedly for a long time and and finally I got to the point where I got some partners I got a, a couple of guys or a guy that would invest in a deal with me I would do all the work they would get you know half the money and and we did that for a while. And then I came across, I met this guy named David and he showed me, he came from the movie industry and he showed me how they raise capital for movies because in a movie, you can't get a loan, right? When you're making a movie, you can't get a loan. And so they would put everybody, they pull everybody's money together and they'd have this cap, this capital stack and how this worked out and everything. And I learned from him and I saw how I could do that. But then what I had to do is I started having to make a lot of relationships. You know, the one thing that I'd done when I was building, I was focused on, on, on the client. I was focused on getting another client to build a building for. But as I began to understand that capital raising is a relationship game and you're, you're, you're making relationships with investors, you're asking them who they know, and you're able to help them solve their problem. You know, the first capital raise I did, I kept asking people to help me. But when I realize that we're partners and I'm helping them as much as they're helping me because they can't invest in a multifamily apartment complex, they don't have enough capital. 
But if they invest with me, together we can do that. And so I began to put that together and really began to look at how I can meet my investors' needs. And the more I work on meeting their need and helping them achieve the goals that they want, the more I find that it's easier and easier and easier to raise capital because I'm not focused on all I want. I'm not out there asking, hey, give me money so I can build this. I'm saying, hey, would you like to partner with me on something huge? Would you like to partner with me on something that's life-changing and it will do these things? Does that fit with what your investment thesis is? And when I do that, I find that it's very, very easy to reach them and to meet them where they are and help them achieve their goals, which in turn achieves mine. You see, a lot of people don't understand that concept because most people think, you know, it's all about me, it's about me. But in business, it's no such thing as I. It's just a team. You can go further with the team. And that's one thing I teach all of my students, Shannon, whenever I do my courses and real estate classes for people, that's the first thing I teach. You have to be keen and aware of your customer's needs. Don't worry about your needs because the monetary will come once you serve your clients. I love absolutely, it. Absolutely correct. You're just absolutely spot on. Now, I love how you had mentioned about how Hollywood raises capital. Now, how is the industrial market the hidden ATM of real estate? You know, the reality is um, everything. everybody right now is focused on multifamily. It seems to be everybody's darling child. And I think that comes from, you know, the, the first thing you do is you buy a duplex and you house hack one side and then you get a fourplex and, and everybody just kind of grows up with multifamily, I guess. But, you know, industrial is... I don't want to call it the big kids game, but there's a lot more institutional capital involved in industrial uh, product than anything else. And the reality is at the end of the day, cap rates have always been higher on uh, industrial, which means there's more yield, there's more money for the investors and the institutional um, funds that are available are usually from life insurance companies that want long-term loans. So there's not a lot of bridge money there. There's not a lot of that, but the tenant, The tenant is really the golden goose in this thing because the tenant is a business person. The tenant is signing a multi-year lease. The tenant is paying all the expenses. It's a triple net lease. So if my property taxes go up in a multifamily deal, I get to eat it until I can push the market and raise the rate. But if I have a tenant that has a five or a 10 year lease with me, every year we look at how much were the property taxes, how much was the insurance, how much did lawn care cost? Did we have to deal with snow removal? And all of those are tenant expenses. So we collect a deposit every month for those expenses and we pay them along the way. And if at the end of the year, the tenant owes us money, great. We raise the rate and everything. So when I get my rent, my rent is my pure profit. And that's the thing that, you know, when you go to the ATM, you stick your card in and you get your money out. There's none of this, stick your card in, you turn to the guy behind in line, you say, here's one for you. And you go over here, you say, here's one for you. It's yours. And all the expenses are the tenant's responsibility. And the other thing that I get with with that is they leave you alone. They're business people. They're not sitting there watching Oprah eating bonbons pissed off because of sink stripping right? They go in there and fix, they don't even worry about the sink dripping because they're too busy making t-shirts or cabinets or, or, or whatever it is they're doing in that space. And so it's very low maintenance. It's very low impact. And it's and the profit margins are there from the beginning because the rent is purely yours. I like the analogy that you use right there, Shannon. Oh my God, you're a really, really great storyteller. You said you said ATM. I had to bring in line behind you. He wants that 20 bucks. I mean, he's not going to say no. You know no, that. Definitely not. Now, my next question, Shannon. Now, now we're doing really big deals here. Now, how is your mindset to go into something this, this large at this magnitude? Where is your exact mindset, sir? You know, the real thing that you have to understand is that that if you know your numbers, and this is the benefit, I've been in this business for 30 years, right? I mean, uh, and, and I've been I've been doing the numbers. And when you really know your numbers, you know, a lot of people got caught up in, in 2019 and 20 when money was cheap and they thought that was forever and it's not. And now they're in a, in a different situation. But if you're underwriting properly and you're going out to the market and you're, and you're looking at a long-term horizon, You know, real estate is one of those funny things that will correct itself. It's not like a Tesla, right? I mean, you can actually get in trouble in real estate. And if you have enough road, you can figure that out because 
but because pricing goes up and down, rents go up and down, but if you've got enough road, you can do that. And so really coming back to your underwriting, knowing your, knowing that your numbers are correct, knowing that you've got a margin for error, knowing that you're not just doing this to get a deal. I've seen that so often, people get so caught up in, I gotta get a deal, I gotta get a deal. You know, so they buy something, they pay too much for it. it they, they underestimate the expenses that it's gonna take to remodel it or whatever and they find themselves behind the eight ball and then they do the worst thing ever and they panic, right? And I've had deals go bad. I'm not gonna lie to anybody about that. I've had deals go very, very bad. But at the end of the day, it's that experience that tempers you, that allows you to keep it on the rails and to understand that, yes, this deal went bad, but we've got this going good, we've got this going good. And so the, the total control of your mindset and looking at what's positive in your life, you know, when we started this podcast, we both mentioned how grateful we are to be here today. And a lot of people forget that the gift of life is the best thing you could ever have, but you can ruin that gift by focusing on all the negative in your life. And it's really hard to be around negative people when your focus has to always be positive. And so if you if you look at that and you keep your mindset in check and you keep your, your thoughts and your emotions going the right direction, and and really embrace what you do have then all the rest of this stuff becomes easier but if you have the best project in the world the best staff in the world and you're a negative nancy you're never going to really enjoy it you're never going to get there and things are always going to start to fall apart and it's almost like if you've got control of your mindset if you've got control of what you believe and what you project into the world and you stay in that positive energy you're going to make lemons uh, lemonade out of lemons you're gonna you know you're gonna be the person that that understands that this too will pass and you're gonna be able to put your best efforts into the day and into what's coming into your life instead of looking at everything and going gosh that's a problem gosh that's an issue i can't do this i can't do that see i have a, a relative in my family uh, uh shannon that they always like look to it's like the, the most worst things and yep. then when, it, when when things fall apart like the jenga puzzle they're like, right. how did this happen to me? Well, right. you kind of spoke that onto right. yourself. So you Absolutely. have to alter your mindset. You know, Tony, you proved it right there because here you were 21 years old. I remember doing my first deal, right? I mean, everybody, it was, I didn't invest my, uh, my last $500, Tony. It was my only $500. I didn't have one before it, right? I mean, I had $500. I got the earnest money on this deal, but I remember th the same thing like you, I can do this. And then from there, you know, the belief in yourself, you can't really expect other people to believe in you if you don't believe in you. Yep. If other people look at that and go, man, I don't want to deal with Shannon because he's so negative. I want to deal with Tony because he's so positive. And it, it's a natural magnetism, but you also attract negative uh, circumstances into your life. You know, you attract negative people, you attract negative things. And I'm not going to get into the universe and all that stuff, but I, I am absolutely here to tell you 1000%, you will get what you put out there, whether it's with your students, whether it's with your customers, whether it's with your investors, if you're projecting negative, if you're projecting, you know, mediocre, you, you're going to get that. If you're projecting high energy and positivity, you're absolutely going to have so much of that in your life. You're not going to know what to do. Now, I do have one other question for you here. Now, we're talking about a lot of money here, but one thing we haven't talked about, Shannon, and that's going to be taxes. So when you're doing these really big deals like this, is it like a lump sum for taxes or is it a way to kind of eliminate the taxes? Well, you know, Tony, I learned a long time ago, I don't like my big, fat, ugly, ugly Uncle Sam, right? The guy is greedy. He takes my money. He doesn't even ask. He just helps himself to the potato salad with the fork he already used. You know what I mean? And I learned very early on, if you can eliminate your tax bill legally, and I do it, I, I've done it 12 of the last 13 years, I've not paid taxes because I have made sure that everything I do is structured properly. Here's what most people don't do. They don't look at the tax implications when they get in the deal. They don't look at the proper structure to have when they get in the deal. They look at it and they go, hey, I got this under contract. I got two weeks to figure this out before this thing goes off. And I got to figure out, I don't want to pay taxes, right? I mean, we have a deal right now, Tony, I don't know if you're familiar with opportunity zones, right? But opportunity zones are something that uh, the Trump the Trump administration passed that allowed reinvestment into low income areas in the United States. And there's there's like 500 areas in the United States that these are in. But if you invest in an opportunity zone, 
you can defer your taxes that you would owe on capital gains until 2026. If you leave that investment in there for 10 years, you can uh, come out the other side and not pay capital gains on the other side. Well, that's a good thing, but you layer that. So I bought a property that had an a, a industrial building on it. We just recently got it rezoned to a 200 unit apartment complex. So me and my group, we buy the industrial building. It's cash flowing while we're going through the rezone and we get the rezone. And now during that time, we took the bonus depreciation. So we got our depreciation last year on that. And we took about, we, we invested about $2 million in capital. We took about a $1.5 million write-off year one, right? In year two, we're gonna demolish the building. So we're gonna take the rest of the depreciation and the two and a half million dollars in depreciation this year. So we're going to get the rest of it. So now we got a dollar 50 of depreciation for every dollar we invested. Now, so if you think about this, you sold the property in, in 2021, you invested in this property, you got depreciation that offset that taxes, you got depreciation you're going to use on the income that's coming in. And when we hold it for 10 years, you have no taxes when we go out. So by structuring these couple of pieces together, we've completely eliminated. In fact, we've given back more tax money than you're going to pay in and we've protected future earnings. And so a lot of people don't understand that if you structure properly and you think this through, there's a great opportunity for you to pay no taxes. And the best way to do that, I, I'd love to say I do all this stuff myself. I do a lot of reading uh, on, and stuff, but I, I've, I've recently in the last couple of years, I've hooked up with a tax advisor named Larry D. West III. And you guys have got to, if you've got tax things you want to talk about, Larry's a guy, he's uh, he is a, a right-brained accountant. So he thinks outside of the box, which most accountants think inside the box, but he will help you strategize and set that up so that you can come up with solutions. And there's lots of strategists out there, but your accountant is not a strategist. And so when you put that together, you layer this together and you come up with what you want to do to eliminate that tax bill. Now, every investment you do is 30% richer is 30% more. So you take 100% of your money, you invest it, you come out with 130% more, you do 130%, you come out with 147%. Everything you do begins to expand because you have uh, not cut off 30% of your income every time or 20% of your income every time and send it to Uncle Sam. So I've paid a lot of attention. I'm very passionate about tax and tax avoidance legally. Yeah. Two other questions for you here, Shannon. And I'd like to ask all of my guests these last two questions before we part ways here temporarily. Now, if you had to use one word to summarize the previous year, 2022, what would that one word be? You know, I think um, 2022 was um, one word. I want to make sure it's one word, um, but it was it, it was interesting. You know, because in, in one, we, we had two different camps. We had the people that have gotten involved in real estate in 19, 20, and 21, and we were returning to higher interest rates. Those of us that have been in here a long time, we were looking at it going, that's what happens. So it was interesting to see how those worlds were colliding. A lot of the plans that people had made aren't working out the way they thought. It's interesting. And it's also going to be a, 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 a year that people look back on and go, oh, that's why you, you need to be working with somebody with experience. Now, last question. If you had to use one word to summarize the current year, 2023, what would that be? Normal. Because this is the real estate environment I grew up in. I've never seen 2% interest rates, right? 8% is a normal interest rate. We're adjusting that. Uh, sellers are having to lower their prices. Cap rates are going back to where they, they normally are. Things are returning to normal and for those of us that have been around a while, we're just watching everything, everybody scurry around and try and, you know, make things happen. And we just look at that and go, yeah, this is normal. There's always, you know, Warren Buffett says, uh, you know, the fear, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets. Well, we're coming into a great time to buy because there's a lot of people that do this in the stock market. They get in it, you know, when Tesla's at 500 or they, they see Tesla at 500, they get in at 900, it falls back down to 500 and they go, what the heck? They sell their Tesla, they take the loss, they blame it on the stock market instead of their lack of uh, you know, their, their, their personal ignorance. 
And we're seeing a lot of that happen now with people that are not experienced and we're returning to a very normal place. Real estate is a strong investment in inflationary market. It is an incredible investment in recessions. It is an excellent investment investment because you still can leverage it. And the reality is, Tony, come on, 8%? You're borrowing millions and millions and millions of dollars and they only want 8%? That's a fantastic leverage point because no investor anybody ever has wants eight per no 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 Tony listen 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 that's too much that's too much money man that's too much just give me eight percent I don't need any more than that just give me eight percent you're never gonna hear that now if my listeners Shannon want to get in touch with you sir what's the best way you know the best way to do it is just go to my website it's shannonrobnet.com you can i've got a book list there of highly recommended books you can see the live uh cameras on our on our construction job sites you can even get to a link in my calendar to schedule 15 minutes with me and we can chat about what your real estate journey is and how maybe we can work together how i can improve that thank you so much for being a guest on the show today shannon until next time i'll catch you later